Buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon to you all. Welcome back to the second part, the afternoon session of the um, Charles V Marcelino Oreja European Award, uh, the European Projects Modernization and Governance in a Plural Framework with Shared Values and Goals. So this is the afternoon session, and we will have the intervention by Matteo Larufa, who will be speaking about the defenses of uh, democracy and its risks in Europe. It will be chaired by Enrique Moraviellos Garcia, um, professor of modern and contemporary uh, history and uh, a professor at the University of Extremadura and chair uh, um, holder of the Jan Monet chair in the University of Extremadura. Thank you for coming here today and uh, thank you for accepting to chair this session. Thank you for, guide us, for guiding us and uh, talking to us about these uh, values, shared values in Europe. Thank you, Miguel, for the presentation, always very kind and warm. This is uh, usual in by Miguel and Juste. And very good afternoon to you all. I hope you are relaxed and uh, making a good digestion so that we can work fruitfully in this afternoon session with uh, Matteo Larufa, who is a political scientist. I like or I feel a bit nervous about that political or, or professional category, sorry, because I'm not sure politics can be a science, but it, nevertheless it has been um, accepted as such. He um, is, he has a degree at the Luis Guido Carri University in Italy and has been trained in many other centers, in many other institutions, but his speech, his presentation will be following the footsteps of the previous ones because we've heard about Europe and the identity crisis and he will be talking about the crisis, the crisis area of the identity because the paper he's presenting will be facing a topic that in classic terms we, we could call philosophical deontology, uh, purely philosophical deontology. The crisis of the democracies and the crisis of the democratic countries of the European Union and the European Union itself. So I'm sure that he will be doing an elegant and profound presentation as profound and as, uh, as elegant as the paper he submitted for this seminar. Well, at least he will be tackling, even if he doesn't say so, he will be tackling the characteristics of the classical philosophical theory from the Greek and Roman um, fields with the three functions that have to be performed by the public administration the public function, cohabitation between human beings who are not fathers or sons or parents or um, offspring, but neighbors in a community. And the function of stability, stabilitas renum, the um, balance, the dynamic, the ever dynamic balance in a political order. The second principle is legitimacy. He will be talking about it in a very deep way. Legitimacy here is the answer to that question that's always at the basis of the human behavior. What is fair? What is unfair? What is socially good? What is socially bad? And the third category will be effectiveness. Things can be durable and can be stable, can be um, fair in a, from a legitimate point of view. and we can abide by the law or the authority, but they must be efficient in any case. They must preserve and guarantee the reproduction by identity, the continuity of a social order that can never go to the worst, or at least it can be improved and be for the better. That's the problem in the crisis. And it also implies solving problems, be it in one way or another, by governing with transnational and supranational rules or through policies. 
I'm not sure I'm not sure they are contradicting to each other. They contradict each other because, as you say in one of your references, there cannot be such thing as social life without uh, an accepted rule or an obeyed rule. So this paper tackles all these topics with elegance and with attitude, and you will be impressed by his youth, and we will have a very fruitful debate, I'm sure. That's why it is a pleasure for me to present this uh, contribution of uh, such a high level. And now I give the floor. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for your introduction. It was very kind for you to read very well my presentation, my, my research. Um, usually we start saying thank you, but today we'll start saying sorry because it will be maybe a bit boring. So please be brave, face the challenge with me, uh, because I understand the time is not probably the best. Well, the presentation is on uh, this uh, uh, topic, the defense of democracy and political risk in Europe. So it's something quite important for the stability of the European Union or just of member states today. Uh, I will proceed. Um, that's more or less my recent uh, political career. I moved from Rome to Harvard University and then to Berlin uh, for finishing my PhD. And I'm so happy that next week, exactly in a week, I will defend my dissertation. That's the, um, these are the topics I will talk about today. So we will proceed from a bigger picture, that of Western societies, because there are many trends that are common, not just to European member states, but US, Canada, and so on and so forth. Then we'll talk of a few aspects of the European integration, above all in relation to the economic uh, dimension of the integration, and Francesco already talked about it, so I will go quite quick on that point. Then I will move on the national dimension, directly talking of the um, institutional defenses of democracy at the national level. And if we will have time, I hope so, we can also talk of uh, Hungary as a, a member state and what uh, did happen in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, I would like also to thank the foundation for organizing this exchange of ideas because it's very important that the raw materials of a democratic education is to start talking uh, with a honest confrontation and exchange of view. And that's what uh, you are doing and we'll try to do today. Well, let's start saying that uh, uh, that's uh, a map showing the evolution of democracy using an index, that's Freedom House Index, made in the United States. There are many others you can use. That one made uh, by the economists or others. And you can see there are some countries that perform quite uh, uh, bad in the last uh, years. A few of them are also member states of the European Union. And I select this group of countries because Eastern European countries still today represent a challenge for all of us. Uh, we consider most of them, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, as uh, basically an example of democratization that happened without many problems. But today, we are seeing a reversal. The point is why and what will happen uh, from so many points of view. That's uh, something that we cannot ignore, just into political stability, the, the role of Russia, and what will happen in terms of controlling uh, the, um, the political consensus of many of these countries. And we can also see uh, the same data through this uh, uh, graph. We uh, observe the trend along 10 years until 2017, and as you can see, the worst cases are Hungary and Poland. Uh, the other ones did not perform very well, but the green lines that you can see as trends. But we will focus on Hungary at the end of the presentation. Well, election by election, there has been a growing consensus for virulent form of opposition to democracy. And the big... Uh, Moot point of the debate is that until 15 years, more or less, no one could say, oh my God, democracy will die, okay? Today, if you uh, go to many uh, bookstores in the United States where there are 
political science section, you find more or less uh, 25, 40 percent of books saying democracies in crisis will die, will not survive, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that um, democracy is not anymore the only game in town. And that's something quite new for Europe. Um, and everything we can say that started with what uh, Viktor Orban called the revolution of the ballot boxes. Uh, there is a famous motto that was uh, uh, actually uh, a wrong or adapted translation of Latin that you might know, Vox Populi, Vox Dei. And in Romania, there is another one that says Vox Populi, Vox Dei, in order to indicate the ballot boxes, okay? So how uh, the, the will of the electors can basically change the uh, stability of a society. Let's see quickly these uh, three tensions that uh, uh, changed a lot the conditions, the environmental conditions of many democracies. So the first one is citizen disengagement, then radicalization of politics, and finally we'll talk of less responsiveness of policies and deviation from traditional sources of legitimation. All them, but the first one are related to globalization. Uh, I will talk quite briefly about citizen disengagement because it's a theory that uh, uh, is uh, still um, accepted without any big critique in terms of consensus in the university uh, communities and academia. It's basically after the publication of this book by Ronald Inglegart, uh, The Silent Revolution, at the end of the 70s, that we started thinking a transition from collective loyalties to post-material issues. Uh, that means uh, we are losing, or actually we lost, because it's something that happened decades ago, most of the uh, different forms of aggregation association that uh, were keeping united part of our societies. That means stability. While after the 70s and 80s, we were moving toward an atomization, and it's interesting to see that our society lost their glues, what were keeping the people together, in a way. Just think to the concept of trade unions, ideology, and so on and so forth. While today we have personal loyalties, Nothing bad against, for example, genders and so on and so forth. But these are uh, actually salient issues that don't create the same kind of social mobilization, like where, for example, welfare state, uh, social rights, uh, economic rights, and so on and so forth. Um, Robert Putnam, who is an important scholar from uh, Harvard University, also the author of Social Capital, uh, he published this book that's, uh, the title is quite emblematic, Bowling Alone. You cannot actually go <laughs> to uh, have fun bowling alone. It's impossible. In the United States, that's something quite uh, iconic, okay? But you can see uh, with this title, he simply wanted to say that uh, people were escaping from any form of aggregation, preferring to continue alone uh, rather than in a, a social formation like association, committees, and so on and so forth. And that's something above all weird for the United States. Already Tocqueville was speaking about a uh, different form of organization. So that one was the first tension that we can observe. Our societies became more liquid also. Uh, Zygmunt Bauman was speaking about that. The second one is radicalization of politics. And I'm trying to connect these uh, point directly to the theory of Branko Milanovic, that's another important American uh, economist who published this book in 2016, uh, describing the dynamics of where the money through the period of the globalization was going, uh, basically far from Europe <laughs> and toward Asia. But what is more interesting inside this uh, movement of money and capital is the winners and losers of high globalization, that he uh, used this expression to say the period between 1989 and the financial crisis, okay? So the people that lost are middle and lower middle classes of the old rich countries, basically the European countries in the United States. This tells us uh, something important. Can democracy survive with a middle class that's disappearing? I honestly don't think it's possible or easy or feasible. Uh, and Milanovic also mentioned uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who was exactly explaining that middle classes uh, mitigate the extreme political parties. 
So we should also understand why today there are these kind of radicalization uh, in many democracies. And he described all these through this uh, uh, curve that, as you can imagine, is called the elephant curve. You can see it's the silhouette of an elephant. Uh, and I just uh, ask you to focus on the point uh, indicated by the letter B. Basically, the European countries and middle classes are there. That tell us that through a long period of time, um, the income per capita did not grow a lot, almost zero in these countries. If it doesn't grow, there is anyway an economic loss. That tell us a lot in terms of how we are changing uh, as uh, also economic condition of European democracies. So I already explained the first part of this slide saying the role of mitigating extreme uh, politics, but I think there is something quite interesting in terms of time, the concept of time in politics. If you are very poor or you are losing everything, you cannot simply believe or accept a policy proposal that will take years to change the country. And these simply say that there are existential conditions that directly influence the consensus for some party. So if you are a serious politician, you will say, okay guys, in south of Italy, it's my country, the place where I come from, we have a high unemployment rate. It will take several years to go out of this. Are you ready for that? No one will vote you, okay? <laughs> well, it's much easier simply to say, you know, we will close this border, we'll do this uh, uh, tariff, and in a few years, one year, everything will change. We'll see this number going down. This tells us that economic condition will always have an impact on uh, the consensus for a few uh, parties like populist ones. The second part is probably the most, the last uh, trend is probably the most complex because it's not related just to one country, uh, but to the European integration, but all form of international and supranational integration, just think to the financial market regulation and so on and so forth. Uh, so we observe a shift from national to supranational level of decision making, and that could be okay. It's perfectly fine if there is a democratic procedure that gives legitimation you know, to the decision till the upper level. But the point is when we shift from political to independent technical institution, who will take the responsibility before the voters? That's another question democracy cannot avoid to find an answer for. Uh, the third part, a few states will control more these processes of decision. That's also normal. Okay, just think to the pre-meeting uh, before the European Council between Merkel and Sarkozy. It became a praxis in the political institution, in the negotiation. Okay, so what Malta can say? That's, is it fair or not? Is there still the equality of member states or not? So all these problems cannot be uh, considered like they are not part of our today status quo. We have to face them. So we have external top-down sources of legitimation. 40 years ago, voters were electing parliament, members of the parliament, and then uh, government could decide, take the responsibility for their decision, eventually voted, being voted out of the office. Today, we have an external top-down source of legitimation. All the Italians, just to mention my country, always say, Brussels is asking us to do that. We cannot ignore all these, okay? We have to find answer to this uh, uh, political position. Then voters actually can change leaders. They can change parties, majorities, parliament. But the point is, will the policies decided by new majorities be different or not? Actually not. If you see in Italy, or if you see in most of our countries in the European ones, yeah, we change a lot majorities. Let's take a look of the parliament before Five Star Movement, the Northern League, the yellow-green government, as we call it. And now, well, there is not a big difference in terms of economic policies. Huh? And we are seeing it today with all the tensions with Brussels. But that's not just related to Italy. 
So is really effective the power of the water? And this is uh, something that we can observe in so many other political systems. For example, in the United States, there is an interesting uh, research from Princeton University saying that the average vote doesn't matter at all. And yes, the power of economic uh, interest group is so, so uh, important. And they did it with uh, actually quantitative research observing and tracking if the proposal voted by normal average citizens will be realized by the parliament, in that case, the Congress or not. And finally, you cannot see it because there is this small square with my face, but national parliament have less power to represent, control, and decide. So are they just taking the role of rubber stamp? In some cases, probably yes. Uh, above all, related to the economic policies. Um, and Nadia Urbinati, she's an Italian political scientist of Columbia University, most uh, working on theory of democracy. Um, she said, yes, there is someone else beside the citizens, okay, who is authorized to decree what the substantive problems are and whether they are solved or not. So, uh, more than a crisis of democracy, because there are populist leaders, that's true, but before them, there are causes that we cannot ignore. So we will not solve Matteo Salvini problems or uh, powers in terms of consensus if we don't give an answer to all these questions. Uh, I will go very quick on these points on the European economic governance, also because Francesco already talked about them, uh, but there are so many social paradoxes and institutional paradoxes that uh, basically, we decided to accept as union after the fiscal compact. Just think that Article 3.3 of the Treaty on the European Union say exactly this, okay? That the aim of the union is high competitive social market economy. That's fine with everyone. But then aiming at full employment and social progress. What's the attention given today by the European institution to these two aims in comparison to deficit and debt? So, who will be the voter following a model of political integration that will give more emphasis to deficit and debt rather than social progress, uh, fighting against social exclusion and discrimination, social justice and protection? It's something that we could already prevent, understand. The union could not go toward a, a brilliant, perfect future with this condition, okay? So we have to recognize it and start changing a bit of stuff on our organization. And also political paradox. Uh, Don Marcelino <laughs> mentioned uh, Jacques Delors. And indeed, in 2012, he uh, gave a statement to a press conference that I think was exactly telling us what the problem of the union. Tensions between government by rules and government by politics. Sometimes simply we don't have uh, political decisions on so many policies. We just adopt and follow rules. But our societies are changing and rules cannot prevent everything. So we will always have uh, some failure in terms of public policies. That's why we have a pre-electoral definition of many policy goals, again, in terms of fiscal policy. That's something we can see. Uh, but also pre-political surveillance of the policy making. Um, for those ones that mention politics, usually I offer you this definition by Moises Naim uh, that say exactly that populism is not an ideology, it's basically a political strategy, just following the most convenient way to get votes. That's almost perfectly fine when, um, but it became dangerous when we are in the time of digital revolution, for example, when we are in a precarious state of our economies and when there are people that feel threat in their social security. Uh, again, why the problems that I mentioned before are relevant for the condition of democracy? Uh, I mentioned the case of Italy because these are the causes of consensus for populist parties. So Italian, if you see Italian employment rate 2017, and you see the yellow side of this map is the voters for a five-star movement. The two maps are very close. Higher is the unemployment, and people vote five-star movement. 
But as I said, it's not just populism. So sometimes we still have some uh, ideological approach to politics as Northern League. So we can explain this map in a different way in terms of the migration crisis and uh, uh, competition of uh, uh, jobs that most of the Italian in these regions still feel, although it's an improbable, not a true or realistic fear. Um, now, I mean, I have quite an American approach to this uh, issue that uh, actually is effective or not the function of the European Union to protect democracy. After what we see in Hungary, I would say not. I'm sorry for that, I'm telling you so many bad news, but it's not. That's why uh, the most effective protection of democracy are at the national levels. But we can improve this system. It's important we will try to do it. Uh, Jean Werner Müller, uh, who is probably the leading expert on populism worldwide today, he indeed declared recently the European Union is failing to meet the challenge of protecting liberal democracy. And that's not something that we can ignore. We are the democratic part of the world. Like we export a democracy, okay, <laughs> in this way, in terms of ideals. But centuries ago, before all the mistakes of Iraq and so on and so forth. Uh, so how to check if institutions are ready for this challenge of populism or not? How to map all these, to observe these in an empirical way? First of all, I needed, and that was uh, also part of my research for the PhD, to uh, find a model of political attack against institutions. And usually there is always the same kind of uh, uh, method. So majorities first start by uh, adopting a verticalization of power. This is something we observe in parliaments. That means uh, unilateral decision. If you see with data, I will show you them, uh, how many times, uh, for example, the Polish parliament, the Hungarian parliament, decide keeping open the debate with the opposition. It's, it's astonishing, the numbers are going so down. So never before, for example, Orban, uh, the majority in the National Assembly in Hungary, decided in this way, adopting always rules to keep the opposition in a position actually of silence, okay? And there are many procedures that the majority can use for it. When they move from consensual or open decision to unilateral decision, the second step is an expansion of power. So they change uh, all the independent institutions that they try to uh, control and limit the executive into neutral or loyal institutions. Again, the case of Hungary is uh, very important for this. They acted on the constitutional court, uh, media committee, uh, authorities that monitor on elections, uh, civil rights, political rights, and so on and so forth. And finally, they actually could also change the constitution. So the last step of this uh, uh, strategy of attacking against the liberal institution is, okay, let's get rid of the separation of powers that we know it, rule of law, and let's adopt preferential constitutional rules. That's exactly what happened in Hungary, okay? So if we uh, keep in mind that uh, model of uh, political attack, the result is this one. So democracy is protected, first of all, at the electoral level, when there are mainstream parties that can actually have the consensus of the voters to keep the extreme in a position of minority, or anyway, just uh, at one side or with small percentage of votes. That's one. But when the first defense of democracy fails, basically the election can also fail to protect democracy, okay? We can vote to get rid of someone, but also to give again consensus to someone. Orban was reelected. So there is nothing like a, a, a mechanism without uh, flaws in this uh, uh, kind of vision of election, okay? Elections are not the perfect defense. Second, political institution. So when the opposition failed actually to create a limit to the power of the majority, and then the third defense is the independent institution that I already mentioned, and finally the constitution. Uh, in my research, I also consider some case studies like the United States. Uh, but for example, the United States has such a strong constitution that they will not have the problem that Hungary had. And Trump has so many limits. 
so I'm more optimistic on that. And that's important also for us as Europeans, okay, because we have so many connections with them. So how to measure democratic strength? Until today, we have so many index of democracies that monitor the quality of democracy. For example, uh, the opposition is free to debate and criticize the majority. Okay, that's fine. Political rights are respected by the incumbents. That's fine, and so on and so forth. But is that the democratic quality or the democratic strength? Well, I think that most of the current uh, uh, indexes, they don't tell us how strong is a, a system of institution to resist to this kind of attack. And that's why the idea was to have uh, um, an index of democratic strength that can measure the capacity of a democracy to withstand to political attack. That means to resist through time and preserve political identity and the institutional integrity. This is a binomial combination that they go together, okay? You cannot expect to have an independent constitutional court without specific kind of institutional rules. The two things go always together. These are the main components of the index that are political defense, institutional vigilance, and constitutional entrenchment. Um, now, don't be scared, but that's just to keep you <laughs> awake. Uh, well, the point, the main challenge was uh, when speaking about political defense, how to measure political power. There was an almost lost paper by Robert Dole of many decades ago, uh, in which he used to uh, propose a, a statement of power comparability. And I tried to adapt that to today. So political defense measures the exact limit the opposition can pose to the majority. And we will observe it in terms of how many times the parliament can vote without uh, bypass rules. I will explain you now what bypass rules are. Um, this is a statement of power comparability, just to keep you awake suddenly, <laughs> because it's quite uh, uh, scary, but it's uh, actually just um, probability, so it's not very complex. It's a probability that uh, the parliament adopt a decision without, for example, take it or leave it procedure, okay? That means the opposition can talk, debate, have time to control, challenge the majority, control the, opposition, the government, and so on and so forth. That basically is simplified in the last one, okay? And if we measure the variation through time, we can see if one majority is abusing of the political power or not. So it's quite easy, simple as model. Um, then institutional vigilance, that's uh, an additive variable measuring a few uh, aspects in a bef before after comparison, and these are all the aspects. I know it might be a bad, a bad slide because it's full of content, but I'm sorry, we had to, uh, to debate on it. So for example, um, protection of level of remuneration. Almost no one talks about that, but in Hungary, if you are a member of the Constitutional Court, today there is not this kind of protection. While the autonomy and the insulation of an institution like that, that needs to provide actually an independent function for democracy, should require this kind of uh, prerogatives, okay? Like the executive cannot cut the fund for the Constitutional Court. That's a threat to their independence. Just to make an example, but we can also uh, consider another variable that, are, that is diversified appointment procedure. That means not just the minister, not just the prime minister, not just the government, not just the majority can decide who will be the member of the constitutional court, simply. And it's diversified because there is an involvement of the opposition, for example. Um, just to make the case of Italy, the members of the Constitutional Court are selected by one third by the President of the Republic, one third uh, by uh, the Parliament, one third by the judiciary. So it's something that it's not easy to control. No one can monopolize that procedure of decision and say, okay, this Constitutional Court will be in favor of me, of my government. While today in Hungary, 11 out of 15 of the members have been appointed by Orban. This tells us it's not an independent institution anymore. And constitutional entrenchment is a very easy variable because it measures simply 
um, if it is easy or not to change the constitution. And I consider these uh, five sub-variables, uh, like repeated debate or supermajority or the existence of eternity clauses. So it's the part of the constitution no one can change to make a, uh, an easy example, okay? Germany has eternity clause, Italy, um, some parts of the, of the academia say it, also the American constitution, but we, we don't know that because it's a very short constitution. So let's go, this is the formula uh, to sum all the variables. If you have then some question you can ask me, we'll go back because the time is flying. Um, let's see Hungary, that I think can be called a defenseless democracy today because it's an electoral machine. So there is nothing more than uh, uh, an empty system of control today. And there were already two uh, original weaknesses, okay? The first one is that the majority could use that kind of procedure that I mentioned before, that they call bypass rules. Basically, there is a proposal by the majority and the opposition cannot do anything but vote against. But the role of the opposition is not just to oppose, okay? The opposition has to control over the government, might amend the proposal of a bill. There are so many other functions that are completely denied today. And the second point is uh, the uh, Hungarian constitution, this was actually an amended version of that one of 1949, was already a weak constitution. So I monitored the asymmetric rules that I just mentioned. Uh, they are uh, basically private members' bills, okay? And Kim Lei Shepler, that's um, an important political scientist from Princeton, but she has a lot of connection for her uh, nationality with Hungary. Uh, she studied a lot this case, and you can see the definition of private member rules quite uh, clear, that's procedure where there is no committee review, no multiple readings, no mandatory consultation with opposition party or interest group. Basically, the majorities go for and approve it without a lot of debate. But what is more uh, scaring in a way is the second statement that I mentioned here, that 10 out of 12 constitutional amendments were approved in this way. So the constitution is exactly the set of rules of the game that majority and opposition, they should adopt together, or at least debate on it. They require a lot of consensus. So let's see political defense quickly. You can see that uh, in the first period, when uh, Orban was governing, um, that variable go down like never before, okay? So the point is how the majority uses or abuse of the, of the power in the parliament. That's the point. They tell us that one decision, actually a bit more than that, uh, out of two, have been adopted without a debate in the parliament. Never happened something like that before. And similarly, we can see it in Poland. Something like this happened also in the first two years of Trump, but then the Democrats won the majority in the Congress, so things changed there. Uh, institutional vigilance. These are the main uh, independent institutions that were completely uh, changed. The Constitutional Court, then the authority on uh, media and communication, um, the authority protecting civil rights, and finally the election committee. And as you can see, this is uh, the condition of constitutional entrenchment before the adoption of the new uh, fundamental law, 2014. So th that constitution was very weak. There were just 20%, let's say, of this uh, uh, sub-variable uh, of protection for that constitution. It could, in absence of eternity clause, be completely changed. A new government could rewrite everything. The only thing was supermajority, and Orban had a very big majority. <laughs> and then there were no repeated debate. It's something in Italy we have, for example. So the chambers should vote at a time uh, after three months, uh, chamber after one. Uh, vertical amendment procedure, that means, for example, is there a referendum? No. 
are there regions or uh, federal states that should vote for approving the new constitution? No. It was very weak. So since the end of the communist regime, uh, the constitution was already a weak institutional structure. So this is, uh, well, there is a mistake here. You see that uh, vertical value axis and so on and so forth. I don't know why it appears, but you can see this red line. The red line is exactly the moment in which the new constitution was uh, enforced. And political uh, defense was the first variable I show you, but if we combine all three together, the democratic strength of Hungary went so down. So I tried to give um, a quantitative representation of all this. This is a case of Poland. You can, you can see this uh, is a quite <laughs> a complex, actually, curve uh, with an interpolation. But the, the problem is that I didn't have all data because they don't translate as the Hungarian one, the Polish. So it was very, very hard to find data on that. And where you see uh, the value with star is an estimation. Till today, we don't have uh, all the data, unfortunately. But anyway, just during the first period of uh, the populist government, democratic strength went down a lot. So the, the lesson from this research is that there are strong and weak democracies. That's, that's the point. Not all democracies can resist the same way. And indeed, if you see the period, the average value that I show in this uh, uh, table, in a way, it's consistent. Poland has uh, more uh, defenses than Hungary. That's also why I think they will not end in the same way, these democracies. At least I hope not in the same way. So um, the last part of the presentation is on uh, the emergence of a new political culture. Uh, this is a famous sentence by Alexis de Tocqueville saying that we have to be very careful when we manage with freedom. It's not a joke, okay? Uh, because usually there are people that believe power is absolute, and that's not just something, a problem of the person who govern, of the incumbents. And that's why I think it's the last challenge to protect democracy. So we observe the emergence of um, uh, what I call an absolutism of the people. And it's also interesting, Isaiah yeah, Berlin was used to say that um, the only thing that's actually absolute in a democracy is a right, but not the power. That doesn't mean just the power of the person who govern, okay? But also the person, like all the people together who vote, they cannot have absolute power. If you hear so many of the political um, speech of people like Salvini and so, on, and so on and so forth, they basically promised to the people to give back the power that the electorate had 40 years ago. Globalization has changed everything. This power will not come back to the hands of the people, okay? Uh, that's why democratic absolutism and the last challenge is the final domestication of power. That means democratic education. That's something that in Europe we don't even... <laughs> Speak about that. Um, so going to the conclusion, also because we have, actually these are second, <laughs> no, these are minutes, okay, so the number of the countdown. Um, well, uh, the point is we should try to find strategies to mitigate the adverse tensions on democracies. That means effective policies. We cannot continue in this way, okay? I, I know that there is also very high rates of unemployment in Spain how long these conditions can still produce a, a politics that's compatible with democracy. I have no idea, actually, okay? But if we continue, this is a bomb. And one day it will explode in our political system, as in Italy. So the first thing is mitigate this tension. That means effective policies. We cannot ignore the problem of the people, okay? Or people will be disaffected then with uh, democracy and strengthening the defensive principles of our institutions. How to do it? There are different ways. First of all, the central argument of the research is that um, only democracies without defense can remain totally loyal to their principle. That is, who wins will govern. Honestly, I don't have any problem with a populist win, okay? If people vote for them, it's okay. But they cannot dismantle the institutional system, so then give back the state in a condition that's not anymore a democratic state or where there is rule of law or something like that. 
So democracy means we have to accept they win, but they cannot destroy everything, okay? And finally, how to strengthen European democracy and reduce political risk? I have some ideas, but I mean, there might be so many other options. For example, we don't have an office monitoring the quality of democracy in Europe. We monitor budgets, okay? That's okay, we monitor financial uh, consolidation perfectly fine, but who cares about that? No one. But one day these people that we know will arrive to the European Council or the European Parliament, and this is something that's happening today. So, guys, the house is on fire. It's not just something related to uh, climate change, okay? That's why I think we need this kind of office. We should monitor the quality of democracy in Europe as it's done by the Department of States in the United States. Freedom House, the, the index I mentioned when I started, is based on public funds of the United States federal government. Uh, that means permanent control on how these institutions are performing in terms of democratic quality. Then democratic education, that's not just studying democracy or talk about that or exchange ideas, debates. It's, for example, participatory budgeting, civic activism, things that exist in the United States, just to make an example, but also in some uh, of the member states of the European Union. Finally, sanctions. I mean, Poland until today get more or less 9% of all the European funds of the European budget. That's a lot. 9% of the European budget for one member state is a lot. So there will be ways in terms of sanction to limit this kind of crisis of the democratic governance in Poland and Hungary. We didn't do in Hungary enough, and now it's very hard to come back. So the last point is institutional alignment. That doesn't mean make all the institutional similar, but at least to provide principles of democratic defenses. Because when we will see that they are destroyed, it will be hard without strong shock of the societies, because then it means opposition needs to be violent to make possible their voices actually heard by the majority or things like that, it would be hard to come back, okay? That's why I hope people will, will matter on all of this because it's not just, you know, the principles of the founding fathers. This is exactly our society today and we should take care of it. So I thank you for your attention. If you have any question on the formulas, let me know. I didn't want to, you know, make everything more bothered than it was. Also, it is a challenge for me to speak at this time. Um, but yeah, if you have any question, don't hesitate, ask me everything, I will try to answer to everything, okay? Thank you so much. <laughs>
Because how can you pretend to suspend the European Social Fund to a member state which, are, which is actually acting, helping people? And this would create uh, more uh, adversity and, uh, let's say, negative attitude to the European Union, which is not only judging a member state, but is also preventing the member state from the funds uh, that are needed to for social cohesion. So this is this uh, this critique applies to the macroeconomic conditionalities. What about uh, uh, you know in the proposal of the Juncker Commission for the next uh, uh, multiannual financial framework, there is uh, the possibility to apply this democratic conditionality on on uh, uh, on the structural uh, uh, funds. But I was always wondering, how can you say from, from the European Union, I'm going to suspend the, the cohesion funds because you didn't respect the rule of law? What about those people who are voting, who are usually the most hit by a crisis or the poorest one? You, say, you tell them, well, you won't receive the money that you were supposed to receive because the EU said no. You would increase even more the adversity to the European Union. And as regard permanent control, uh, well, it's, you know, all the debate uh, on democracy that has been launched in the UK. Uh, so how to have a supranational democratic institution, institution that takes into account the, the democratic decision-making process in a member state. So who is legitimate to intervene in, in that case? From a democratic uh, perspective, the EU or uh, the member states? Who is sovereign in that case? Thanks a lot. If you want to answer. Oh, yeah. It works? No. Can you hear me? No, the more or less. So. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> I can speak also without a microphone, but I... Try, try now. So? OK. Well, uh, thank you, Francesco. Well, on the first um, question, the rule of law in member states and how to use sanctions, well, the first, I think, barrier to the effectiveness of whatever kind of sanction is unanimity. And Luigi Naudi, that was one of the Italian important politicians of last century, was used to say, in relation to the Security Council of the United Nations, uh, whatever there is unanimity, there is no authority of an institution. That's exactly one of the points of the European Union. So sometimes we should decide, okay? That means vote. If we cannot have unanimity, at least let's find a majority that could be uh, less limiting the aim of a political institution, because that means simply keeping the stability of, or the condition of the status quo without any change, any action. So we, we need actually to uh, vote sometimes with different methods, and that's uh, on the long term a change that occurs from unanimity to majority, but still there is a lot to do, not on sensitive issues like uh, sanction for political reasons. Um, so you mentioned macroeconomic conditionality. You're right, it's possible to act through uh, changing probably the funds. I know there might be externalities of that, in terms of side effect of this uh, decision, but also without touching the funds. I mean, it's possible to limit the participation of uh, an executive that's explicitly illiberal in a consensus of government that are all democratic, in other ways. For example, the participation to a vote. Um, who is legitimate between member states and the European Union? I would not ask myself this question rather than whoever will decide should be legitimate, whatever will be the level of government. So the problem today is that there are some decisions taken at the level of the European Commission that are not enough um, legitimate in terms of democratic involvement of citizens. That's a problem. So it's, it's not enough that we vote for the member states it's important that we, as citizens, observe a transition to a more effective involvement of the decision-making process or the uh, appointment of the European Commission. I think the big problem there is the European Council, actually, that bypass so many of the uh, transparent procedures that actually whatever kind of democracy requires. 
it's not enough that you are entitled to decide for Italy, Spain, France, and so on and so forth, because you are head of state and so on and so forth, or government, but you should show to the others why you vote on something this way. What is the transparency in this kind of decision-making procedure of the European Council? It's not enough you are entitled to do something, okay? Because democracy requires also to control. Thank you, Matteo. Any other questions? Over there. Hello. I just uh, missed in your presentation the role of the rule of law and uh, international courts, especially the uh, European Court of Human Rights or the European Court of Justice. Mr. Marcelino Oreja reminded us just this morning how the European Court of uh, so the European Court of Justice was the one that stopped uh, this. Uh, infringement procedure with uh, Poland. Well, I think if we have strict rules, and we have a court of justice, which is appointed, uh, formed by uh, independently appointed professional law makers or law appliers, this is the last warranty for democracies in Europe, the last trench or the last fortress, I guess. Did you measure that in your paper, or did you consider that? Thank you for the, the question. Well, I actually mentioned saying that that's a mechanism that doesn't work very well, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but just to make an example, okay, there are so many publications by lawyers working for the Venice Commission on what was going on in Hungary and Poland. But who actually applied those suggestions, recommendations? If we would have followed the suggestion of many lawyers of the Venice Commission today, there would be no problem with Poland and Hungary at all. So it's to give them more power probably, then we have to ask ourselves how to do it, okay? And how to control also them. Um, but yeah, the point is I think they are partially uh, giving an answer to the idea that we need this uh, kind of monitoring structure over our democracies, but it's not enough. It's not working enough. I mean, politically correct people will always say, yes, everything is okay. But to be honest, what happened in uh, Hungary is, uh, it's a radical transition. When a lot of judges are forced to retire, seven years before the end of their terms, and uh, members of the opposition, for example, cannot participate to the parliament uh, meeting for uh, three months as a punishment, that's not a democratic state. That's why I tell you that it's not enough what Venice Commission, Council of Europe, all them are doing, the College of Europe doing, all them. It's not enough. Simply that. That's why I focus more on the institutional structure at the level of nation states. Because historically, also because we can observe them uh, more frequently, so we have more data on them, they're very more effective. Simply that. Otherwise, yeah, it would be perfect a world where there are people uh, controlling over us, but it's, it doesn't work today. Or the effects are so limited, so limited. Ruth. Hello, congratulations for your speech. Um, I think you woke up us at this time of day. Um, I, I have two questions. One question is concerned to methodology, and the other one is a conceptual one. The methodology one, how did you choose the cases? So how you explore the possibility of taking another case of another European country and measure those uh, indicators that you choose it? And if you did, uh, could you tell us mm -hmm. where the results? Because um, you choose two apparently similar cases, right? Following the comparative politics models and that kind of thing. But I, I, I would rather think that the, if you compare with other, let's say, Western European democracies, it would be interesting to, to see if the difference is so huge or not. And um, the concept uh, one, on the conceptualization one, why did you, you didn't use the concept of illiberal democracy? Okay. 
Okay, thank you for uh, the questions. Both of them are very interesting. The first one on method. Actually, the case study selection was based on, first of all, it was a challenge also to study Poland and Hungary because Hungarian and Polish are very complex languages. And again, it's not easy to find documents translated, okay, or data. Um, indeed, I, I have always to thank you, my Polish and Hungarian friends who translated for me a lot. But I decided to study these countries because the emergency was there. Like Klaus Hoff, who is a professor at RT School, told me, um, you should study Germany, but you will not find anything. Okay? Mm -hmm. That to say, you know, it's, uh, there are optimal conditions, and it's not so interesting to study them. I wanted to study Austria, 2000, the first government that was alarming us, and then the recent one, uh, but actually didn't have enough time. That was uh, one of the problems. But I studied the United States, Hungary, and Poland. And already the United States is a very complex system. So as I am one, I don't have a lot of support. Uh, managing all the data was not easy. But uh, yeah, if I will continue my academic career, I will try to extend this index of democratic strength to many countries. I have some ideas on Italy, probably for a publication. Uh, but it would be a surprise that I don't think it's a weak system. So Salvini can govern, I'm not scared by that. And the second thing on concept, illiberal democracy is a concept uh, full of ambiguities. Maybe you know the work on concept analysis by Giovanni Sartori, and everything started on that. So I try to avoid this kind of concept that tell us everything, but actually we don't grasp any case study, okay? So many people uh, in academia usually say, let's not call them uh, liberal democracy, but competitive authoritarianism, because our authoritarian state, like Levisky in way, there is a famous publication in 2001, uh, where in an authoritarian regime, people can vote, okay? I think the distinction is very small between this uh, conceptualization. That's why I try to avoid them, just. Yeah, I, I actually mentioned the presentation Mueller. Yeah, I mentioned him for uh, populism. Because uh -huh. um, I saw the other one. Yeah, it was a small sentence in the end on the European Union protection of democracy. But yes, why not? People can, can use other labels if they want. I simply uh, think it's more interesting today to focus on the point that to participate in a democracy, we should be aware the power of the people <coughs> is limited to, okay? That's a realistic approach. That would be the first way to say to people like Orban that they cannot promise everything to everyone and people will keep voting for them. So it's more, uh, I'm focusing more in terms of concept on democratic absolutism. There is a nice publication that will be uh, online uh, in a few days. So then I will send it to you too if you want. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, over there. Thank you, Matteo, for the great presentation. Uh, I saw on your last slide on your conclusions that you included the democratic education. That's my fault. And that's a big fault, to be honest. Did you touch it uh, more in depth? Or did you propose something on democratic education? Or just uh, you propose it as a solution uh, for, uh, for, demo for, for democracy? Or did you go more in depth in relation to the democratic education? Are you mentioning, sorry. Thank you. Are you mentioning in terms of, uh, of the paper that I sent to the foundation or just for? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I will for sure try to improve the conclusion in terms of uh, more proposals. When I speak of democratic education, it's basically um, something that I derive from Alexis de Tocqueville's idea of art of association uh, that we, we don't focus on, but our society is gone if they can actually improve in this art or not. Uh, so it's, uh, in terms of democratic education, as I already said before, it's not something very theoretical, not something related to school, and not something related to academia or universities, but is how to improve on an everyday level uh, in the life of citizens, their participation. And I was mentioning uh, budgetary, uh, participatory budgetary in the United States, uh, where basically um, 
the public administration of a small village can call all the citizens and say, okay, we can decide together where to spend money for this, how to invest money for that, and so on and so forth. And the people on an everyday basis are involved. While the current vision of political administration is you vote for uh, the next one, and then at the next election you will see them, okay? Asking you to vote, basically. Um, while democratic education means an everyday participation. So I, I did that example, but there are so many others in terms of taking care of public spaces and gardens or uh, changing uh, the urbanistic vision of a district and so on and so forth. There are literally thousands of examples on that. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I will premise my question and comments on the fact that I'm not coming from academia. I'm a practitioner, having worked in many years in a European institution, and now working uh, in uh, a bi-regional organization. Therefore, I will not claim uh, neutrality in my comments. Uh, the first point concern uh, uh, participation and mobilization. In one of your first uh, slides, you're referring to the fact that there have been a progressive disengagement of citizens. Uh, now, uh, if I observe what is happening not just in Europe, uh, but also in Latin America and part in the Caribbean, um, I would say that in certain cases, uh, citizen participation has been uh, one uh, of the uh, more dynamic uh, element uh, of what you would call the political defense, uh, because they have been able to stop processes uh, that would seem unstoppable. Uh, and uh, one uh, interesting case for me in the case uh, of Europe is now the case of Slovakia, where mobilization has been an important factor. So I wonder if uh, in certain cases uh, the observation on citizen disengagement is based uh, on a concept that still consider very much democracy linked to electoral cycles and to the fact of people being linked either to parties or to party-like structures while the current engagement uh, of uh, uh, citizens or people, it's uh, uh, more related uh, to uh, single issues. Um, but I wouldn't be so, um, I wouldn't dismiss it as a form of disengagement, but rather as an evolution. And the fact that you are finding engagement uh, on global issues. So you mention uh, uh, gender violence, uh, one can think about climate change. You have a form of engagement uh, at transnational level and I think uh, they represent a form of uh, political defense. Um, in other uh, comments, uh, you have made it already, but I think when we are talking about the European Union not having been able to react uh, time uh, uh, developments uh, like the one of uh, Hungary and Poland, uh, I think uh, we should be very clear that we are referring to what's happened in the European Council. I think uh, a lot of uh, the uh, prerogative uh, of the Commission have been sapped uh, de facto. And uh, you mentioned before the case of Austria, Austria was a case of uh, a, a process uh, of sanction. Uh, and after that, uh, the council was so scared uh, that uh, it made much more difficult uh, uh, to intervene in a case uh, like uh, Hungary or Poland. And indeed, uh, the, uh, for me, was uh, quite... Um, it was a very good choice to choose this to country because uh, the uh, development uh, uh, are uh, blatant. And, uh, and I think there has been also uh, as a reason why the EU has been slow in reacting uh, as something to do with what you were saying, language, uh, the fact that they are felt still to be 
a, an annex to old Europe, and therefore uh, there has been less of a reaction as it was the case uh, for Austria. Austria was very much at the core of the European Union. Hungary uh, or Slovakia or Poland are felt to be more of the periphery. It is uh, not now the concern with the last uh, uh, European uh, election was very much uh, because uh, populism was taking roots uh, in all the Europe, but we have tolerated this to happen uh, in, uh, in new Europe. Uh, and I think one point that we should, uh, probably you have done it, but you didn't have the time uh, to discuss here, it's the fact that, that uh, a regime like the one of Orban, it's extremely successful uh, on the economic side. And therefore, uh, his win is not only, is not, not only very solidly uh, in power, but uh, it's also increasing uh, its uh, uh, support. So how do we uh, solve uh, this uh, issue? Is, uh, approved by the, by the citizens, uh, it gets uh, an increasing uh, um, support. How, how do we deal with it? And we can have this very same situation 2020 in the United States uh, if the positive uh, uh, economic uh, uh, cycle continues. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for your question. I would like to clarify a bit on the first point, that of um, disengagement. Uh, because this disengagement doesn't mean, from the point of view of uh, political theory, that people, they don't want to participate anymore. It's simply that our society lost the old social cleavages that were dividing our communities, but at the same time giving them stability. So we knew that uh, there were uh, communists and Christian Democrats in Italy in the 60s, okay? They were dividing the country, literally, uh, but at the same time they were keeping the political debate quite stable, okay? While the uh, political atomization changed everything because everything can turn into a radical uh, transition soon in terms of political debates, that's why we talk of uh, volatility of the votes, simply. You, you saw probably the result of the European election in Italy. I mean, Five Star Movement lost millions of votes. As two years ago, the Democratic Party of Renzi lost the same amount of votes. So there are a lot of people that start participating not because they are loyal to a party anymore, that's why collective loyalties die, but simply because they, they are following um, in a more faster process of change, new political proposal. That's what uh, disengagement uh, means from the point of view of political theory. But there is mobilization, that's true. You mentioned the case of Slovakia. I don't know what will happen there. No one can actually um, guess the result of that political mobilization, but we'll see. I hope well. Um, and the European reaction, uh, the European Union reaction on Italy, you mentioned the European Council as the problem. I already said also when I was answering to Francesco, I think that's, that's one of the main problems today. It's true, they, the European Council saved the Union in a moment of crisis, okay? Because that one was the forum, the forum where actually leader could find an agreement. But at the same time, we should say that we need a more democratic process to decide now that we are not designing on crisis management uh, as uh, in 2012. Um, the last uh, question was on uh, the economic performance of Hungary. I think that's, that's um, a very bad news for people who are uh, uh, trying to promote a different vision of politics rather than that of uh, Orban because people will keep vote for them. I was showing that slide on Italy in Five Star Movements and Northern League to say that there, are, there is populism and then there is a new uh, ideology. Now we say right-wing uh, extreme parties like Northern League or uh, Fides and so on and so forth. So I don't, 
consider Fidesz as a populist party, but actually as a new ideological party. That's why they will not get their vote because people are not happy with their economic condition. They are happy, they are improving their economic condition. Okay? This is not a good news for, for the people who fight for liberal democracy. Um, on uh, United States, well, again, I'm not so pessimist, pessimistic like many uh, experts on the US democracy. I think they will survive easily to Donald Trump. Uh, and he's not doing everything bad. Like, there are things that are bad, things that are good, because they are uh, observing the result of those policies. The economy is going well. So the point is, people can also confirm the consensus to a person like Donald Trump. But he is not in a weak institutional system. And he will uh, eventually taste the directory uh, test the, the limits of, the, uh, of his power if he tries to do something more. He's also a very lucky leader. Machiavelli was used to say that one of the, the ingredients of the political success of a person is to be lucky. He's lucky because, for example, uh, most other two members of the Supreme Court are close to retire. They, they don't have to, but on average, when they are 80, they retire. These are statistical data. And, some of them are 81 already. So maybe he will be the only president in the last uh, century to appoint more than two members. This is something that can be dangerous. But the whole system is so uh, entrenched in itself in the protection of the political identity. For example, they need the vote of the states inside the United States to change the constitution of many states. It's almost impossible. It happened 27 times in more than 200 years, okay? So I don't think he will destroy the system. But he will take advantage of the economic performance, for sure. Thank you. Would you like to reply? Just one point. It's not uh, to reply, but uh, something uh, uh, had noted uh, and I didn't mention before. You mentioned on the absence uh, of an agency or an institution monitoring the quality of democracy. There is, in fact, an, an agency with the it, fundamental rights agency, which, however, has played a very minor role. It all started already with the status of an agency being in Vienna instead of in, uh, in the core of the institution. But uh, it could be used much more uh, aggressively uh, as uh, to, to measure the quality of democracy on the basis of the impact uh, fundamental rights. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, um, well, you're right. For sure, we don't see the same kind of effort as, for example, that we see in the activism of the Commission for the European Semester, okay? Like, it's not a part of the European Commission structure where there is actually somebody that should say, there are some problems in terms of uh, freedom of the media in this country. So there is an alarm there. Because the um, perspective that democracy in that country will be still good is uh, something important for everyone. For the reason that I mentioned at the end of the presentation, like now people like Salvini are getting consensus and arriving to the upper level of the European institutional system. But that's not something that started yesterday. That's why I'm always telling it's, it's important to make effective mechanism and also with the same share of attention that we give for financial uh, parameters and criteria to political ones. Because these are the, th this is exactly freedom, civil rights, these are not jokes. When a person, I don't know if someone here was a member of the parliament, maybe uh, Don Marcelino was a senator, but if somebody cannot speak inside the parliament because simply say something against the prime minister, that's a violation of fundamental civil and political rights. That's not less important than deficit and debt, just to, to summarize. Thank you. Don Marcelino. Yes. Uh, all with enormous interest speech. I would like to ask you, what is your judgment? About, about the process of accession. We start with six, nine, 12, uh, 15, 12. 
And then, after the war, the war the process, where a certain number of countries that probably didn't have reasons, little reasons to join, wish to join the union. Really, were these countries sufficiently prepared to join? And what is your idea? I remember the uh, president of France in 1990 uh, said that perhaps instead of having such a rapid process of integration, there should be something different. That didn't went on. Finally, countries that certainly didn't have the conditions to join, they did. The two rhythms of integration uh, is, is a possible measure. How would that work? I, I, I don't know. I simply don't know. So, what would be two commissions? Third, hmm. two parliamentary assemblies, perhaps. That's a, a, a concern I have because a certain number of countries, uh, well, for political reasons or they, they wish to join, but they don't know exactly why. Simply to be in, but they don't have the, the conditions. But why the other countries leave so many facilities to join? Imagine, imagine the, case, the case of Spain, that a little better, it took a very long time. It took from, we made the, the demand of accession in 77. And we didn't join in 85, 86, 1st of, of, of uh, January 86. Probably Spain was in much better conditions than many of the countries that joined at the end of, of last century. Well, that's the idea of two rhythms of integration is a matter of concern. I, I don't see how that can work. Do you have some idea about all this? Well, thank you so much. Um, well, the, the accession process has never been, um, I would say, as serious like than being a member of the, the European Union in a way. And that's maybe the first problem because, yeah, we require so many criteria, like the Copenhagen criteria, that were exactly the, the most important landmark principles in terms of democracy and rule of law. But why we don't keep monitoring uh, as they were requiring this kind of uh, reforms in many states, that, that's something I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know why the European Union changed in that way. For sure, it's, uh, you, you asked my opinion on uh, the accession of so many countries, and I think you refer to the Eastern European countries. Um, my vision is similar to that one of Jean-Paul II, so we mentioned both him today, because he was used to say these are two like twin parts of Europe, they should go together. I think there is a will in many peoples to uh, live like us. I had the chance to live in, seven, in six countries out of Italy, but anyway, the quality of life that our European states give us, there is no comparison with others, okay? Uh, so I think people that were leaving the communist regime could actually really feel the will that the promised land was Europe for them, it became like us. Um, so that, that could be the, the reason why they wanted to join us. Then there are so many cultural reasons. Christianity might be one, for example. Um, but I, I honestly don't know why we don't give the same emphasis to the Copenhagen criteria today as during the process of accession. Uh, the, I think the problem is always there at the upper level of leadership of the European Union. Let's say also the European Union has already enough problems that we shouldn't add more, <laughs> perhaps, um, because if we would start monitoring that, there would be so many things to do, probably new uh, policies to adopt, new strategies. Uh, so I, I don't know if it's actually a problem of uh, leadership, but it might be, that might be. I think that the problem related to the European Council is, uh, is uh, one of the, the dangerous 
problem today of the European Union because sometimes it simply say, okay, let's agree on something, so I will not sanction you. Yes. Imagine uh, it's not uh, the organization we are, we are discussing, but the idea of the Council of Europe having, I think it's some 48 uh, countries, it's completely absurd. It doesn't make any sense. And remember the difficulties we had to join the Council of Europe. That was very difficult at the beginning. Uh, and we had to make some exceptions because, as I was mentioned before, a country needed to have a constitution because they had a bad impression of what had happened with Portugal. Well, and after all, all those difficulties, and well, we could join in 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 uh, seventy seven. And now there are, I think, forty seven or forty eight countries in the Council of Europe. How do they work? I mean, I don't know this temptation to join the institutions, at the Council of Europe, the European Union. I, I'm not sure that it makes much good to, to Europe. But of course, it's not to us to help it. It's mm. the decision that was taken by the governments. The, the final word, because we are running out of time. If I may, the question you ask is uh, extremely interesting. But my question is, uh, one of the political justification is to attract uh, the country of Central and Eastern Europe yes. uh, into the realm of uh, Western Europe. So the question is, uh, what is happening now in Poland and Hungary would uh, not have happened in case they would not have joined it. I think, yes, it would have happened. It would not have been the problem of the European Union, but still, they would have been our neighbor and uh, uh, bound to have an impact. Maybe the fact of joining delayed what's happening now. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I would still think that uh, the fact of uh, this country joining has given uh, and can potentially give uh, its the council uh, uh, play well uh, instrument uh, to modify this negative trend. Your final word. Well, uh, I would like to thank you everyone and also say sorry if you see a bit of pathos in my presentation, but the point is are actual problems for so many people. And I realized that when I actually started having friends from these countries saying, I want to help you, because you will let me understand and explain to others our problems. And then we go inside the real life of the people. And then this is actually the real life of many countries in Europe. So it's not just an academic format that I actually, I say sorry because I, in a way, was pushed by the pathos out of it. But in a way, it's, uh, it's really important we consider out of academia, these are the real problems of many countries. And we will take care of them, I hope. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Mateo.